This is Tauri Talk, the podcast from the Scuderia Alpha Tauri Formula One team. What did you do? What did you do? That mega! Keep delaying by a step of five minutes. Yeah, if you can give me a couple of sausages. Paradise, like tropic paradise. Wait, what the f is that? <laughs> Good job! <laughs> Hello and welcome to Tauri Talk, the official podcast of the Scuderia Alpha Tauri F1 team, taking you further behind the scenes of what life is like in Formula One. I'm Josh, the Alpha Tauri admin, and today I'm happy to welcome back our Formula One driver, Pierre Gasly. Bonjour. That's all I'm getting. Bonjour. Bon- ah, actually, I should say, hola, viva Mexico. <laughs> and to my left, we have a very special guest. It's your race engineer, Pierre Hamlin. Hi, guys. Glad to be uh, here with you now. So today we are in Mexico and once again we are recording from my hotel room. So welcome back, Pierre. <laughs> I'm very, very surprised both beds, both beds are properly done. Yeah, you, you mentioned Dharma last episode and I've actually watched it so I got it and <laughs> I cleaned my hotel room. <laughs> Let's get into it. But first, I actually have to I have a question. Do we need nicknames for this episode? Uh, I think we probably need, right? They call me Amlino in the in that's the team. What I, I was about to say we call you Amlino. Yeah, that that sounds like a deal. Yeah, yeah, but I can't I can't recall every single day the number of times that someone asks Pierre and then we both turn our heads <laughs> and they're like, No, you <laughs> either showing Pierre or Amlino or, or myself. But um Especially yes. during track walks. Yeah. When people call for Pierre, I always hope it's for me, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> you I, I heard turn, people uh, calling my name, but it's, uh, it's exactly actually, I turn around and it's like no. We're, it's we're such, not after it's you. It's such like a, I would say a common name. I, my best friend is actually called Pierre. You know, it's um uh, you meet Pierre in France everywhere, but for sure working in our environment, sitting next to each other in the debrief uh, and briefing room all the time just makes it quite uh, quite confusing at times. Not to embarrass you guys, but it's been like two and a half years. How have you not come up with a system? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, but, yeah. Because usually we, we change names when the driver name can be misinterpreted for something else. But when Pierre is in the car, it doesn't really matter anymore because nobody's <laughs> going to... We, we know when people call me or call him. Yeah. yeah, basically people just speak to you on the radio. Yeah, exactly. And then you're the only one like talking to... Uh, but it's like, yeah... Pierre calling to Pierre, is Pierre okay? And <laughs> it's like, a, it's a <laughs> but it's like you a s- you sit next to each other in the engineering room. This is this is my point. Yeah, yeah no, but it's fair to say we never really had issues with that, with us. Uh, I know when it's serious, usually they speak to you. And, <laughs> <laughs> and when someone's complaining about something, oh, Pierre Gasly's going yeah. on again. <laughs> <laughs> and when when the boss are coming and are calling calling very loud for Pierre. I tend to turn to towards you. Yeah. So, okay. That's, that must be for him. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So for the purpose of this episode, how about I call you Pedro? Yeah, Pedro. Yeah. yeah. Pedro Gaziozo. Yeah. Uh, Gaziozo, we can skip the Gaziozo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're in Mexico. I thought I'd bring yeah. it up again. Okay. So no, Pedro and Pierre. Least. Let's let's do that. Yeah. And I hope I remember that. Okay. Okay. So. <clears throat> Oops. I've just turned thing. Oh, uh, yeah. We've got the room service. <laughs> yeah. Please come in. Yeah. Thank you. Do you want to join our podcast? <laughs> oh my god, perfect timing. We need some Mexican vibes on the podcast. Yeah, yeah, just anywhere. Like, that's it. cool. Honestly. <laughs> Forgot about that. Thank you. I don't know if we're keeping this in on the episode or not. I haven't decided. Uh, at, at the moment, I'm basically... Putting full room service on, on your room, <laughs> <laughs> charging all to you. Can I change? Sorry, sir. Can I change the, the room? No, it's fine. Just fine. I'll, you know yeah. what? My treat. Oh, my God. Thank you for hosting us in <laughs> even looking after our cappuccino. Well, actually, I'm... Well, I've got one as well. I'm going to put my name because it's easier. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. This was all my Mexican. Yeah. I'm more than mine. Right. Hand us a coffee, please. Oh, look, they even made it. Ertz. 
This is such a romantic yeah, You said it's, it's for Pierre on the, on the, on the phone. So <laughs> I was talking gone. about Amlino, the real Pierre. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. First yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, you're Pedro. You're right. I've got that wrong. <laughs> All right, so I have to hold this. Sugar. Sugar. Sugar daddy. <laughs> <laughs> that's what happens when you skip breakfast. All right, so while you make your coffee and your little mini breakfast, Pierre, we are going to get to know you, Pierre Hamlin. Um, so today, I've got something nice and special lined up for you. Check out flag is out for some reason. Check out flag is out. Keep the position. Check out flag is out. It will be in the park for me. Okay, when you stop P1, wait for the dash on P0, please. Nice job. Really happy. What a man. Fantastic job, Pierre. Fantastic race. Absolutely amazing race today, mate. You should be really proud of your dive. That's for you, guys. That one's for you. Amazing job. And uh, we are one lap down, I'm afraid, so I've got to pay the drinks tonight. Yeah. Drinks on you. <laughs> See you on the podium. So how does that feel like, hearing your own voice played back? Super fun, upbeat music. Nice, nice. Yeah. It's nice. Very, that you know, I, I keep telling myself how many... Amazing moments we have this last... And we've just two, done 30 two, two, seconds of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that was for all their listeners who didn't know who you were and because you, you're obviously the man behind the, the radio um, when you're talking to Pierre Gasly on the, on, the, on the track. So I guess for a, bit of fun, for a bit of a fun one, Pierre Gasly, Pedro, can you introduce Pierre Hamlin to our listeners in your best, like, what does Pierre Hamlin do as a job? He makes me fast. <laughs> to basically basically sum up we are very tight duo so uh, Pierre Armelin French uh, raised and born in France I'm correct right yes <laughs> um, what gave it away the uh, accent yeah <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah he's basically in my race engineer so he's my first point point of contact in the team for anything that I do, so especially when I when I'm in the car, is the only person I, t I talk to. Um, back to me with all the information I need to um, in the race or in the practice in qualifying, and basically sets the car up. Obviously, there are hundreds of engineers behind him, but he's the one gathering all the information, working with the team, and putting like the final product. Let's say I, I call it a product, but putting all the pieces together on the car. Um, before um, the, the before he sends me out on track, so um, yeah, I will say is the 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 man behind the scenes that nobody really sees, but um, that is the first in line um, and the first I'm always in contact with. Yeah, that was actually better than I thought. Oh, yeah, it <laughs> yeah. was probably better than we I talked, thought. I yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we talked about it before the show and like, okay, yeah, Hamlin, I'm going to get you know Pierre to introduce you. Oh, that could be very difficult. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I guess Pierre, since um, your drivers introduced you so eloquently, um, could you give us a bit more detail in uh, your role in the team and uh, how long you've been doing it? And in your own words, what is your job? Okay, so I've been a race engineer since um, 2015. And um, the job, like Pierre explained, is mostly, it's a bit of the, an extension of the driver. So it's a link between the driver and the, and the team while the car is running, but also anytime between races. So um, at the race track, we, uh, we try to put all together uh, the information we have to, um, like Pierre explained, set the car up in the fastest possible way, taking everything in account. But there is also many things we do in the background away from races, which is uh, simulator work, all the um, car build projects, trying to um, work on the development, what's coming next to the car. Where do we want to go with a certain aspect of the of the setup of the car? So that's um, a bit of the work away from the track. And um, obviously, I'm responsible for one of the car, and um, we are together with another number of engineers and mechanics. And I like to think about like when you have a big orchestra with someone managing, trying to manage everyone and uh, put the right music together. So it's kind of trying to put everything together to have the, the correct notes back on track. So in orchestra, so you're, you're, you're saying that you're the maestro. 
I like, I like, <laughs> sorry, I made a no noise <laughs> because I find this amazing. I was picturing like in my head. I was imagining, okay, all the engineers playing trumpet and playing, <laughs> like violin yeah. and just beer there, there as the maestro. Okay, guys. You have Pierre you Hamlin go. as the maestro. You've got Johannes as the first chair. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, uh, it was it's a bit, it's a bit, it's a bit like this, but not in a managing way, more in terms of... Um, whole things have to go together yeah. to have the, the right product at the end. In like layman's terms, let's put it as a puzzle. Yeah, I think, <laughs> yeah, but I think there are different pieces that's you needed fair. to put it together. That's that's completely fair to say. And that's also, I mean, how the, the works team work, like, yeah, functions because you have so many people, you know, we're probably working without talking on the engine part, you know, in fans are like 600 people. So you have different departments. <clears throat> but then after when it comes to the racetrack, you still have probably 40, 50 engineers all working together. And Pierre needs to gather all this information. So it's kind of put, yeah, puzzling the, this, all, all the pieces together to uh, get the, the best car and the be best car setup uh, possible. So if we take it all the way back to the start, where did your F1 journey begin and like what got you into the sport? Were you always F1 determined or were you just, did you just enjoy engineering? So... I've always wanted to work in motorsports, but um, I didn't really have any tie with uh, Formula One, especially in terms of my friends or relationships. So it was a goal for me to, to reach that point, but it always felt like a dream more than something I can actually achieve. So um, I went into the mechanical engineering direction to try to, to get to that um, motorsport industry. And uh, then I started to work out how can I how can I get to F1, and um, little by little I managed to find systems which are how to get an internship, how to how to get relationships in um, the F1 industry. So I started to do that with uh, Renault at the time. Managed to uh, I did um, a mini engineering championship, let's put it that way, which got me to meet some people in uh, in Renault. Got an internship and I started there uh, as an intern. And then once you got your fit into the F1 area, then that's where you, you need to start working hard and try to, uh, to make your way through. It's quite funny because as an engineer, you're obviously very prepared, very diligent and all that. And you've just ticked off about three of my questions in a row in this one answer of like, you know, where'd you begin? What did you do? Where'd you start? Okay, so I'm going to skip, skip forward ahead. Um, so given the industry is very competitive, what did you do to make yourself stand out? Because a lot of people listening are going to want to go into engineering. What would you say, like, what's a good way to stand out? Is it extra, like, curricular he's activity? He's called Pierre and he's French, for sure. It was going to make... <laughs> in, a, in an English team, that was a, a, big, a big thing. Now, I, would, I, I think the, um, there's many talented engineers in our uh, sport and in the industry. But um, maybe what stood out for me on how I got to where I am now is... Um, I've always been working very hard and putting a lot of hours. I've always been very um, very demanding in terms of trying to support the rest team, trying to help other engineers, trying to do as many night shifts as I could when, uh, when there was some tests going on. I I've just always been trying to offer my, offer my engineering to... Uh, to people who needed it and try to, to, to show that I, um, I was keen to work. It's like showing that you're doing the extra one percenters. Yes, yes, exactly. You have to, you have to show that you want to, to do it. And once, once people realize that you're really keen and you are interested, then you can train yourself and, um, and, and get to where you want to be. So uh, I, was I, I will add maybe one thing also, you're very competitive. And this makes the difference because at the end of the day, like athletes got to be competitive, but I see the engineering office <coughs> working in a similar way where everybody, you got the job that everybody wants in a race team. Let's say as an engineer, this is the, the sort of... Uh, um, That's where you want to get, yeah. Exactly, where you, gonna, where you want to get the end target and um, where yeah, all the, 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 the engineers are kind of having this in the back of your head. So to get to that position, like the competition is really high. And uh, I feel like there is also 
a lot of competitions within the engineers to be the one standing out and 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 getting that uh, yeah exciting job. No, sure. Yeah, you need to be um, a bit patient. You know, you know it's going to come. And again, you need to just uh, keep working hard until uh, the right moment comes. But yeah, I think it's a, it's, a fair, it's a fair point. And working in motorsport, like I think most people um, have to move away from home to, to work in the jobs that they want to work in. Obviously, Formula One has only a certain amount of teams as well as other championships as well. So like, what was it like moving away from France to, to the UK to follow that dream of working in Formula One? No, it was, it was difficult. So... During my studies, I've been moving around quite a lot because I always knew that I had to learn English, technical English, I had to, um, to be used to working elsewhere than France because most of the F1 um, industry was in UK. So um, during my studies, I already, already traveled quite a bit. And then, uh, yeah, moving to UK was a, a big challenge because my English then was uh, still, uh, still difficult. And um, obviously, I didn't really know anyone at all in UK. I just went there because I really wanted to get into that uh, F1 industry, and I, I knew I know I had to be there to uh, to get there. So um, I was yeah, dropped in uh, in UK by myself. Mm. But in the end, once you join an F1 team, there is always many foreigners, many people there who look after you and help you. And I think it's a, it's you know it's a very big family. So the start is a bit difficult, but once once you're in it, it's it's pretty good. You just need to persevere through those first couple of months. Exactly, yeah. So going back to the firsts um, of like now that we're going back to like you know moving overseas for the first time and all that. Uh, do you remember your first day trackside? Um, where was it? What role was it? Like I'm sure that's a, yeah, a good I, memory. I remember very very well because it was a very good weekend actually. So I, I've done many tests before. So winter testing. Pirelli testing, like all young engineers do when they want to, to train themselves. But the first time I ever worked on the car is uh, when um, one of the performance engineers was away for having a, a baby. So I moved up to uh, to help and take his position for uh, one race weekend. And this was with uh, Lotus, I think back in 2012 with Raikkonen. And, nice. Uh, <laughs> That was the I was the hangover the next morning <laughs> after the race. <laughs> Is that the, something that's like a bit taunt, uh, daunting as well? Because like Kimmy's obviously not the easiest one seems to work with on the radio. He was just very like uh, straight into the point, uh, and right. you're going for your first race uh, trying had, to engineer him. Yeah, it was it was difficult personally because you had to you know you have you have to step up to the job, and also you have to show people because it's your first time that you're able to do it. But equally, you know, you don't want to do too much, so you just do the basics right effectively. And actually, Kimi, yeah, was a very nice person to work with. There was no no issue at all, and uh, the car was very competitive that year. And we finished uh, P two. Amazing. So my first re- and actually I have a very nice story. Is um, so that's the only race I did that year because obviously the performance engineer came back and I went back in my junior position. Did you ask for him to make more babies? Did that well, <laughs> what's happened is... Uh, Go on a holiday. At the, end, <laughs> at the end of the year, I worked out an average finishing position for each performance engineer. And obviously, having done only one race on finish P2, you were the... my, my average finishing position was P2. Yeah. So I uh, didn't really like that one. <laughs> so what, what was the race, just so we get that out? Like, what was the race that he finished second? And you were performance engineer. It wasn't race engineer. No, as performance engineer, it was uh, Budapest. Budapest 2012. Yeah. yeah. So moving on to where, uh, which race was the first one that you race engineered the car and who was the driver? So the first time was uh, with um, Daniel Kvyat when um, he came back from Red Bull to Toro Rosso. And in, that was in 2015. So that's when uh, Max um, moved up to, to Red Bull. So Spain 2016. 2016, sorry. Um so yeah, Max came, went to Red Bull, Daniel came, came back in the team, and at the same time there was uh, some small um, adjustment in the team in terms of the, the roles and the positions, and that's when I stepped up to a uh, race engineer. And uh, yeah, very, it was a difficult race weekend because it was, um, it was unexpected for me to move from performance engineer to race engineer between two race weekends. And then uh, yeah, from there I just uh, kept working hard and uh, keep, uh, keep learning on the job. And this moves us into like an interesting point because the, the, the relationship between a race engineer and a driver obviously has to be quite solid and you need to be very understanding of each other. And that would have been 
in my opinion, a lot very difficult because Dan, Daniel's just come back. He's been told, you know, you're going back to Toro Rosso. And in the same time, you're moving up to a race engineering position. How did you deal with that? So my approach has always been to um, let the driver come to me if there was any um, personal discussion to have. And apart from that, try to keep keep it professional and technical. So to avoid any of these difficult discussions, or maybe sometimes people, people or drivers or engineers don't want to have discussions about how do you feel, are you are you sad to have come back, or is it difficult? You know, it's a discussion which we can have and we want to have when people are ready. But um, it's good to let people come come to it. So I think. Like I do when we have a new, a new driver or a young driver, is trying to keep it, keep it technical to start. Try to to keep the basics right, and then we um, we go to other personal discussions a bit later on. And obviously, the race engineering position is something like every other role. It's something that you sort of grow into as well as you go along. Um, what are some of the things you've learned as your as the years go by? But also, what are the, some of the things you've learned from drivers that you've worked with? So in terms of the role itself, I think um, obviously what you learn and wh what you develop the most is um, your management of the car on how much risk, responsibilities you're ready to take to make the car faster. When you, when you first start with in, that, in that role, you want, to, you want to stick to the basics, you want to make things right, you don't want to, make, to take too, too many risks maybe. But as you learn, as you gather more experience, you remember what you did the previous year, you remember um, what trick you used to make that corner a bit better, and um, then years after years, you can use this experience to, uh, to get better. And since we're talking about like, you know, working with young drivers and for their first time, I know you've obviously dealt with it uh, in the past. We've had Liam uh, run with us in Spa, and um, we've also asked Pedro here to give us some advice for Liam as well. And I'm not sure if you remember this, but we've, you gave Liam some pretty good advice before his first run. Let's take a listen. Okay, I finally battled the masses and I've fought through and I've gotten PFP. Pierre, what advice would you give Liam for his first official F1 session? I would say, priority, don't crash my car. Do not crash my car. Um, no, I, I must say, I must say, like, just enjoy. You know, it's, uh, we've all been waiting for, for such a moment as, as a race car driver. And uh, yeah, I think most important is enjoy the moment, don't overstress, don't overthink. He knows what to do, he's a, he's a very good driver. He knows how to drive. Take it all in and, uh, and enjoy every single second of it. Is it a bit better for you now that it's raining so you don't have to worry about <laughs> crashing it yourself? I'm more stressed than ever now. Because <laughs> I was like, okay, I just want like a nice, easy, dry session for him that everything ca can go to plan. And uh, I woke up this morning, I was like, okay, it's completely the opposite of what I would have liked. But yeah, a touch more challenging, but uh, all good, yeah. He, 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 he'll know what to do. So Pierre, what do you think of Pedro's advice for Liam? Would you have said the same things that he just did? I think, I think that was really good. I think I would have probably inverted the way of saying things. First, enjoy it, and then don't crash my car. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's the difference yeah, between got, a driver we, and an engineer. We got the priorities uh, lined up in <laughs> yeah. a slightly different, different order. No, but I think from a driver perspective, I think that uh, it's very nice what uh, Pedro explains. And you know, a driver like Liam, who's been um, obviously working with Red Bull for a while, who is doing some simulator, who is um, close to the teams in general, it, it, it's good for him to jump in the car, understand how we work, understand how the car feels on track. To do a bit of correlation, and um, but like Pierre said, it's good to that someone comes and says to him, "Look, you're also here to enjoy it and try to to understand what it is to drive an F1 car." Yeah. So going, uh, and we're still on the topic of firsts. Your first race together wasn't when you first joined the team. So you first joined the team in 2017, uh, Malaysia, Malaysia, I believe. Yeah. 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 And you were on the other side of the garage. So. What's that relationship like of working? Because obviously you're the enemy essentially to, to Pierre. You're, you're well, the first enemy, rival. Enemy, enemy is quite a strong, <laughs> enemy is quite a strong a word. Bit, yeah. We're still like obviously not working on the, on the same car, but still like part of the same team. So we're not as close as we are now, but um, still never really felt like um, there was any, any problem at the time. 
No, but I think I think the story is because the story goes back a little bit more than this because we knew each other. Yeah, from from before, from the fact that you were. I did a test with you actually in 2015. Did, yeah, we did a test and we obviously you were at the track quite a lot. Some being French, yeah. we had many occasions to uh, discuss about the car and what we do. And um, yeah, you jumped across side of the garage a few times before you joined completely with yeah. the other side. But I think it's fair to say our team also is biased in a way where the competitivity between the two sides of the garage is trying, we, we try to reduce it. But I think there was also initially... Yeah, because you came on, I was away for uh, having exactly. a baby as well. Yeah. So, so so I was it's always the baby story. Yeah. <laughs> so you had a baby. That's exactly what's happened. Like I came in Malaysia and, and I, I was, was away for that race. With you. Exactly. Then mm. you, you were away for two weeks. Two races, yeah. Ben you Mitchell. had Ben, yeah. So I had Ben Mitchell at the time that um, basically was my, my race engineer for the two races, so Malaysia and Japan. And then you came back in Austin, but which you, I missed you moved side. <laughs> because I was in Super Formula. So you, I think they kind of swapped the, the roles and the cars. Because at that time, there was Brendan that came in. Yeah, exactly. And Daniel as well. Like You guys had two new drivers. For exactly. And then when you came back... It, it all ended up that you ended up with the uh, other side. And then I went, yeah, I went to the other uh, yeah. to the other side. Yeah, it's funny the way we... And then you went off to Red Bull. And when you came back, you got to the other side of the garage. And then you're working with Pierre. Yeah. Was that an easy fit because you had known him in the past? Um, well, it's never, it's never easy because, as you mentioned, like the, the relationship between driver and engineer is so important to be successful in uh, in formula one and um when you arrive and you start it's one thing knowing a person and knowing how they work but it's a different thing work actually working and you know motorsport is is a specific language it's like to understand each other you need to really speak the same language and i'm not talking about words but i'm talking about feeling when i describe a race car the way that he understands it that it translated into changes on the car setup, etc. So it's um, it's something you develop over time with experience, um, and yeah, working is is different. So I wasn't particularly worried on working with Pierre, but I was still like, okay, I hope that you know both of us can really be a good fit and a good match um, in understanding and. And at the end of the day, you just want to be efficient. You know, you want to go to the track, do your job in the most efficient way possible, uh, be competitive, and um, and yeah, basically that's how you, the the <laughs> usually the easiest and most most successful way to do it. And started really well, like straight from our first race, we had points, um, really good feeling with each other, and um, and then from there it just got better and better. And a few races after. We started in Spa. We already had our first podium together in Brazil. So I must say this kind of uh, made things move uh, pretty, pretty, pretty quickly in the right direction. So working on that relationship, obviously you'd known him before and you worked on the relationship throughout the season. And a good way of doing that is um, spending time together away from the office and that's the track walk. And that's something that we do every race weekend. Um, I'm normally there annoying you guys with like my microphone or like the camera or something. Um, so let's go through what is said um, on track walks. So it's meant to be about engineering, but I, I think we all know it's not all that it's not the case all the time. So let's take a listen. In the field with Scuderia Alpha Tauri. All right. So we've just finished the track walk. What exactly are we talking about when we are uh, walking around each track every race of the season? Like people assume that we are talking technical stuff. Um, partly. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> partly. Yeah, so enlighten the fans. What is exactly happening? I'll start with you, Pierre Hamlin. So obviously we don't have a lot of time to meet outside the race weekends. And it's quite, it's quite hard to get time with, uh, with the driver to sit down together and review what we've done last weekend or what we plan to do for the coming weekends. So the track walk is a lot about correlation to what we've been looking at in the simulator and what we think the track should look like what the track looked like compared to last year in terms of the curves. For example, here we expected the track to be very bumpy, but uh, now we see that they resurfaced a big piece of uh, sector one. 
So those are information that uh, we maybe didn't ha completely uh, have under uh, our radar before coming here. So we'll probably update a few things uh, on setup, on the decisions. And um, beyond looking at the track itself, it's a good opportunity for us to um, talk about what we did in the previous event, what were our, our conclusions from that race weekend, and obviously look at everything we want to achieve and uh, do for uh, the coming weekend. So what we're going to do with the tires, how we want to, to look at the run plan, what are the target of the weekend, what's expected limitations. So that's all the technical things. And then uh, obviously, because we also uh, are human beings, we, uh, we try to catch up a bit on uh, what each other has done uh, over the weekends, who has done what, and uh, talk a bit of uh, private things as well. Yeah, Pierre, I can see you're nodding along, laughing. That's, that's, the, that's the interesting part of the track walk. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I, think, I, I think Pierre summed it up quite well that we never get the chance to actually spend an hour without any distractions. So uh, we can really get uh, deep into uh, wh whether it's technical, like review about the previous weekends, um, how do we move forward with the, the package that we have, how do we uh, arrive the most prepared possible for the coming weekends. And yeah, track work is actually very interesting. We saw tarmac has been changed. So, uh, you know, following this track work, we might think about different uh, you know test item on the setup and uh, you know this is uh, obviously quite important coming into the weekend so that's something we it's a it's a routine we do it every race weekend on every track and uh, obviously during one hour <laughs> it's like the technical part doesn't take the whole lap so uh, yeah it's a I, I do believe it's also a chance for the engineers to, to get a tan at some point during, uh, during the year, otherwise they are just locked in the office for, for the entire time. So it's a, a, a nice way to get them out and, uh, and then after obviously we get more personal with what everybody does um, yeah, over the weekends, what sort of food we had. We are in America, so uh, a nice uh, tomahawk yesterday and uh, you know like just uh, yeah, exchanging and having a, a bit more social time. Are you go for Tomahawk? Tomahawk with Charles. Brisket was my uh, number one on the, on the road book. Uh, we had no briskets but 2.5 kilos Tomahawk, so we got to check the, the weight <laughs> for this weekend. And speaking of the weight, Johannes, you're the performance engineer, you're all over the, the weight scales for, for Pierre. And we see sometimes you guys laughing about how much he's weighing in before a session. Is he always over or is he coming in under? What's, what's, what's the go there? Time of the year. Yeah, it, it depends and uh, normally yeah, you see us having a laugh. We have a bet normally ahead of the weekend to see how much he'll weigh. Uh, What's the bet? Starting, oh, it's just uh, f a bit of friendly banter. It's, I mean, there's no money involved or anything. Normally starting the weekend, uh, he, he starts on the heavy side. <laughs> lately I've been actually, I've dropped, I've dropped some weight lately. He's, he's dropped quite a bit of weight uh, lately. and. Um, yeah, it's, it's just some fun. But now that he told me that he ate two and a half kilos of tomahawk, uh, I wasn't alone. I wasn't alone. I was. It was. It was I, I wasn't gonna let Charles eat the whole meat alone, so I gave a bit of a help. And also on the track walk, I can see there's an iPad in your hand. What exactly um, are you doing with Pierre with the iPad uh, at I guess certain corners? I would assume. So we have uh, onboard videos from past events, um, data. It's just an easy way to check driving line differences, have a look at the data in specific corners. It's just uh, a good tool to have around at the track walk. And the last topic, or the last one for me, is what was the hot topic for this track walk? Ballon was, was the hot topic. Ballon d'Or was the hot topic, or okay. the, <laughs> night, the night you, uh, you hosted me at your place uh, last week. That was good. Farewell, farewell. Uh. <laughs> after, after so many years together, he uh, eventually managed to, uh, I managed to drag him for dinner uh, to my to my house. Did you and you you cooked for him? I didn't cook for him. <laughs> I, uh, I I bought the drinks. It was a pretty bad mental preparation because we played cards and I lost all games uh, against these kids. So I must say, the the mental prep wasn't ideal, but uh, no, it was really really good time. Cool. All right. Well, they're closing the track now, so we should get going. Um, we'll speak to you back in my hotel room. Yes, sir. So that was our track walk in Austin. Um, do you, now that you've had more time to remember it, do you have any other like moments that pop out over the over the year or the seasons that that um, 
some of the conversations you've had? Oh, oh, oh. Putting you on the spot here. Um, well, there wasn't baby stokes anymore. I mean, after you no. left me that first, <laughs> that first weekend. <laughs> Obviously, they, they were always like uh, crispy stories there and there. But I will say track walk is splitted still, I will say 50 50. 50 on the race weekend, half an hour talking specifically about what we need and how, how we can improve uh, from the, the past race. And then 50% is just, you know, uh, just being normal human and, and, and catching up on everybody's life. And usually we, we also like a, a nice group of people. So we are like between five, five and eight people working the track together. So you always have uh, uh, one, one of us telling yeah. what's happened. I don't know. Sometimes you hear crazy stories. I remember... Well, that's probably a bit too deep, <laughs> but there are some uh, police stories like uh, and you know, oh yes, you, yeah, you remember in Spa, in Spa, yes, yeah, and and Paul, one of our performance engineer, got thrown on on the ground for literally no reason because the the police uh, did a mistake, mistaken uh, identity. Yeah, yeah, he was he was at the wrong identity. place at the wrong time. Yeah, <laughs> and that's the sort of things that you hear the next day and you're like, oh my god, that's Hollywood movie. Like, how how did that happen to you? Um, yesterday and, and there is always these things happening, uh, especially traveling. You know the chances of having things going wrong um, increase massively with our lifestyle and and um, yeah, it's just uh, just nice to to catch up on everyone because once the weekend starts, it's just full bananas from Thursday till yeah Sunday, and then everybody goes back home after that. So, so moving on to the personal relationship between the two of you. Do you have any traditions that you keep going on at races? Uh, anything that comes in your mind? Uh, we have one of your tradition. Ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, this one, we can keep it for us. It's <laughs> you don't want to say it on there? No, I think it's, it's better. It's our reward, uh, small reward as a team once we score points. We have a point scoring tradition. Perfect. Yeah, point scoring tradition. That we're gonna keep secret for, for now. And any ongoing jokes that you have throughout every race weekend, Pierre, you might know what I'm talking about. Ah, yes. So there's one topic which you've discussed heavily, and sometimes I'm getting a bit confused why it's so important is um, driver weight. So. We've got Johannes, our performance engineer, with Pierre, and pretty much every session, there will be a one-minute gap where we discuss what they've had for dinner, when is, when is the last time they've been to the toilets, and uh, what's expected uh, wait for the race. So that's uh, <laughs> a, a very important topic for us to get a fast car, but equally it's, uh, it's a good uh, running joke because uh, there's many details going into uh, where do we end up on race day. Yeah, but you guys are <coughs> violating my privacy. You know, you are like... <laughs> <laughs> we need to know every, it. Every single day, I am basically put on a scale and being openly and publicly judged on the number that comes on that on what comes on that scale. It's and a burden uh, that comes with being an athlete. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. But I must say, I can't hide anything. As an F1 driver, literally, they know every single thing. This is, this, is one, do, this is one topic we know a lot. That you do in a race car every word that comes out of your mouth and every gram that you put on or that you lose. And um, yeah, well, it's part of the, it's part of the game, but um, yeah, in Austin, I had Tomahawk ahead of the weekend. So, so Friday, uh, Friday, we got a bit worried, but then it got better. Yeah. Well, actually I ended up with the lightest, yeah, lightest you did. weight of the, the season after the race, but um, that's why it was I, had hot. To, I had to, I had to, Fill myself, fill myself up with a couple of tacos since I arrived in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and this one was flagged to me by Pierre, actually, because he's, uh, he's told me that you like to take a charge in the relationship sometimes. A charge? Take charge. You like to like, lead the, the relationship sometimes, even though it's Pierre's job yeah. to lead the relationship. Uh, and you don't know what I'm getting at, but I'm going to play you something right now. Let's go with the merch. Oh, puta. Yeah, there's Calvin High School on Friday. Don't worry. So what, <laughs> how often does that happen when you sit in the car and trying to dictate when and where he wants to go on track? 
No, but I, I must say it's um, it's important for Pierre and for 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 the drivers in general to have a view. You know, as engineers, we we try to do what what we believe is the best thing. But equally, you know, the driver remains the one who knows what he's capable of doing, and um, when things are right and when when things will help him to put the best job together. So for us, we um, so th this example of uh, quality traffic. We try to manage the traffic in the best possible way for managing our tires, managing following another car when it's the case to try to get a bit Let's of a go toe. with the Mercs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the, the deflation in your voice is yeah. just perfect. <laughs> yeah, but <clears throat> I think at that time you could feel that this wasn't the first time that I had asked for it. <laughs> and that was, I was like... Mm. Not again. Yeah. You know, it, it would be hilarious if you see, if you would have a, a thermal camera looking at us in the cockpit <laughs> and you just see the temperature <laughs> raising, you know, as, as I see the cars pass and I'm not going and... <laughs> Yeah, like, well, it goes I, both I ways. I think we can th we can turn the thermal on Pierre as well, yeah. saying, man, he's just not doing what I need him to. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's... Uh, I guess it's it's part of the relationship and and also with the years I you know you become more aware of what you you want and what you need and in which situation you want to be put in to perform at your best. These are probably things when I arrived like my first year I would have had no clue about and probably because I faced traffic on that track in these particular conditions then I can just relate from this experience okay if I go now, that's probably maximizing the chances that I think. At the same time, there are a lot of things I don't know, and I gotta rely on the on the pitbull because they have more information. Um, but then, yeah, sometimes it's just better to not press the radio button. Yeah. <laughs> and, Sorry, and Pierre, are you talking to in. us? And yeah. like you just see the helmet in the hair going moving you know, around. Many times, you you can't imagine the number of times I'm shouting or speaking inside the helmet and I just double check oh yeah I just make sure I didn't press the radio button on <laughs> we're learning a lot about him now aren't we Pierre <laughs> yeah but it's like putting a mic on like a football player for 90 minutes of the game I I, I think we will hear horrible things because you get all sort of emotions and um, at least we are the one responsible of what we want to put out, um, you, out you, you keep a you keep a filter. That's good. Yeah. yeah. So and that filter I is try the radio most button. of the time, 90, 98% of <laughs> the, the time. There's a the few times it escapes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and there's a few times, do you see that? I open the radio for 10 seconds and it's like just stuck in my lips and then I just put it, I, I put it back on. Oh, so you do have a filter. That's good to know. <laughs> I, I try. I try. <laughs> like, okay, I just... Uh, so mov moving on, moving on to like, w let's move into some of the best moments you've had together. And I'm going to kick it off because uh, there's an obvious one. So I'll kick it off with this. P1, P1. Oh my God. We just won the race. Oh my God. Oh my Fail 82 again, fail 82 now, fail 82, fail, do it now please. Oh my god guys, I just want to say congrats to all of you, all of you, all of you, you did an amazing job, Alpha Tauri, Honda, all the engineers, all the mechanics, everybody in Fanza. Thanks to you, we, we did it! We did it! Yeah! Thank you, mate. Amazing race. You did an amazing job. So what's it like relieving that once again? And you're, you're hearing yourself back on the radio. So the <laughs> first thing him, I feel so... Fail 84, fail <laughs> I was just going to say that too. Yeah, it's... It cuts some silly, but um, obviously... For us, the important thing is still to bring the car back to the garage, even if we run the race. Because so what's happened is Pierre did a, a switch change, which was different from the I think one I did fail eighty two, right? Yeah, I can't remember what yeah. what, what it was to be honest. What I do remember is that I had a number of people screaming to me to roll back on that change. Yeah. <laughs> and um, you know the rules remain the rules, and even if you have high emotions and you're very happy, you still have to follow the rules, which is 
bring the car back to the FIA bridge and uh, make, t- make sure the car is legal. And uh, this is what I was trying to manage uh, while the car was coming back in. And Pierre wasn't having any of it. No. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this is the last of my priorities now. I just want to enjoy the moment. And um, and no, obviously he's right. You know, if I if I don't bring the car back for any reason, I stop. Like you could you could get disqualified. So I, I fully I fully get Pierre. And uh, it's just the the fact that to me the moment I pass that uh, finish line, this is it. It's over. This is it. I've won the race, and and also the. Um, the adrenaline and the pressure was so high, you know, the emotions were running so high uh, in this last couple of laps that once I passed, I kind of let everything um, out. And Pierre was like, fell 84, was like, I do not care, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the radio but button must have been off for that part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was right. And then in the end, I did it a couple of laps later. And then even myself at some point, I was like, does he realize we just won the race? Like, uh, <laughs> So what happens after that uh, celebrations and that we do the debrief? Is it a normal debrief, or do you just guys do you just guys chill out saying, "Look, there's nothing more we could have done. We won." No, it's a it's a particular. On my side, I think it was really unique emotions, and for the next couple hours that followed the race, I was just you know it was like a fairy tale. I had no idea what was going on. So much emotions, like. Uh, people so much uh, excitement from all parts and oh, i didn't really fully uh comprehend the what was going on and uh um a lot of emotions and um obviously when i went to that debrief it's still it's like that that first moment where i i tried to kind of get back on it and just be really focused and put the emotions aside to give a clear feedback and then after that you know it's all um, I could enjoy enjoy as much as I wanted, but uh, just remember coming out of that debrief, like obviously my phone was ringing like crazy on that on that day, and it was like half an hour debrief, and uh, I had this plus thirty three fix unknown number, and I was like I don't somehow I, I'm sure this is an important message. I don't know this number, but I'm no, I'm sure it's an important message. And I ca- came out of that debrief uh, engineering room, listened the vocal and. Hi, this is Emmanuel Macron, your <laughs> French president. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> what's happening today? That's incredible. And um, and yeah, it was odd to me, I must say. Even I, I tried to be as you know professional and focused uh, as I could in the debrief. There was so much emotion that it was. Uh, it just didn't feel normal at all. It was very very unique. And that's the same for you, Pierre. Yeah, the same for me. Obviously, for me it was um, you know there is always the fact that you want to have the official result out from the FIA, you're like, okay, I had enough fuel. That's okay, check. <laughs> and this part of the car was okay, okay, check. No, you, you I knew I knew you, you you had done everything right. I didn't even doubt you a second. So I mean I I, like, I'm not doubting myself, yeah. but it's just you know it is the pressure is really, really high in these circumstances. So you just want to be sure that uh, everything is is done and uh, now we can enjoy it properly. But um I, I must say I wish I wish I was a bit less uh, of a robot in those occasions and I enjoy it a bit more. You know, even afterwards I was like uh, maybe I should have done more in terms of going out and things, but you know, we had the back to back, the following yeah. day we had meetings on simulator and we had to roll out uh, I enjoyed for you Pierre. We had to roll out the, <laughs> the setup for the next uh, the next race weekend and uh, build the car again. So, you know, it's yeah, it was exceptional and I, I must say that, you know, when you are engineering the car and you 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 win a race, it it is very special because you you feel very personally involved in that situation. Yeah, and also like I guess it's the same of like any other greatest moments you've had working together. Could be what what comes to mind in terms of best moments together. Oh, um, I would say a lot. Like all this, it's funny how y- you relate. Uh, personally, I relate like these good moments with good results. Even though we have had amazing weekends, where unfortunately it was only like a P11 or P12 or whatever, and we probably performed in a similar way. But I'm so results driven that um, I would say like this P4 last year. Last year we had so many good moments. 
last, last year, year was um, an amazing year, yes. I remember like just getting into every race weekend. We knew, okay, we're there fighting Ferraris, fighting McLaren. Sometimes we can out-qualify like a Red Bull or, or um, like, yeah, we, were, we just knew, let's do our job and we're going to have a fun time. And, um, and then, yeah, we had a lot of uh, qualifying in the first three rows, um, top five, top six, and, uh, and fighting for big points, which kind of makes you feel, you know, when, once you get a reward at the end of the weekend, for all the hard work you've put together, it kind of feels like it brings you more more excitement. So yeah, it's a bit it's self fulfilling. Yeah. When, when oh, but last year I would say like Baku was a Baku was a stressful one because we we I mean I thought I'm gonna blow up the engine by half the race. We were quite close to to do that. Yeah, and uh, it's actually the race where we had the probably the least performance from the engine because we had to turn it down. Yeah. And this was our, our <laughs> best result of the year. And uh, it's like, yeah, engine performance doesn't matter anymore. Like, we're just, we're just fast, you know, even with the... Yeah, but this again came, you know, from experience, a clever drive, and yeah. what you did with, uh, with Charles in that last couple of laps was yeah. just... Uh, and a bit of experience from the, the Brazil preserved. podium. The, there was an end, like, you, you yeah. turned up the engine to the last couple of laps in that one, too. Yeah, and this was the highest performance... Um, like seen on on that specific engine you remember out of the last corner the honda guy said we have never seen that much power from our engine and it just <laughs> came exactly at the, this specific time where we needed it so yeah we we, we managed to put all, uh, all the right switch together <laughs> to have a good uh, good drag race full bananas do you want to relive that yeah hamilton fights gasly to the line gasly comes home to take second place by less than a tenth a second they are going potty at Toro Rosso that was the margin that settled second place in this race it was a car's length I'm not sure whether I'm giving birth or <laughs> I wasn't sure what to say then <laughs> was the radio button meant to be off Oh my god. I, I did try oh to god. say words. Just the words <laughs> came out in a funny way, but So you're trying to say words. You didn't did you know that the radio button was on or off at that point? Yeah, yeah, but I was like, I don't wanna speak to them, but at the same time I can't like I just, What just language do much. I start with? <laughs> you know, that's what I was talking about earlier. I say motorsport is all about like a specific language between engineer and driver. That's what I'm talking about. Pierre completely understands what I'm what I'm saying right there. So <laughs> So now that we've had the nice, sentimental, heartfelt moments, it's time to clear the air. About? This is an emergency. Please clear the air immediately. So this is your free pass to get anything off your chest about each other without any consequences. No questions asked. This is the last year that you're working together. So... Anything of the chest, yeah. which means any, basically... Any, anything you want to get off your chest about the other person that might have annoyed you a little bit this year, last year, little bits and pieces. I know, Pierre, you've got one, but I don't know about you, Pedro. Um, I, I can start, so you can have a sink. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's, he's been waiting for this. I'm prob I probably know what you're going to say. But. So, uh, yeah, you already know for sure. Um, so the one thing for me, which is... Um, I'm always in a state of stress before the session, is the timings. Because uh, Pierre is never late, he's never been late, but it doesn't leave a margin. I have my own definition of being on time, it's just on the dot. <laughs> so, um, you know, as an engineer, we, uh, we try to think of, okay, everything needs to be right, so when he jumps in the car, I need everything to work, the mirrors are in the right place, the drink system works, and uh, the belts are gonna buckle each other very well. But you know, anything can happen and you lose these two, three minutes in the garage, which maybe means a couple of laps on track and you, you don't want to do that. So, um, yeah, I think with the years, I will probably uh, start to be more and more chilled. But um, it was a good practice. I've changed you a bit on that side. I think you're yeah, yeah. much, much more relaxed. I, I think, yes. And actually, now it's a bit of a running joke in the garage. I'm trying to ask which mechanic would like to jump in the car to yeah. start driving <laughs> <laughs> in case in case Pierre, Pierre is not coming at all. 
but yeah, once again, you know, it's it's uh, it's it's not a, it's not an issue because we've never had an actual problem with that. But it's just uh, the comfort margin of the race engineer. Which I get. I get uh, if if anyone is so in you the get wrong it. here. If anyone is in the wrong here, I, I am the one. <laughs> <laughs> Does that mean we're going to get a little bit of a change for the last couple of races? Or I'll try my best. Okay, I'll really we've got that on record. Best. Actually, USA was great. We USA had, was we had great, time to talk about weather. Um, I mean, the last couple of races when we started from the pit lane was great. I thought I was plenty of time there. <laughs> But uh, no, I'll definitely try my best. And for you, Pedro? Um, no, I was trying to think about it. And I uh, think you're too nice as a race engineer. I can't really complain about it. No, that. I think maybe when I don't give you enough feedback. Yeah, like I, like, I like to be fed with information. I like to, whether it's useful or useless, I just like to know what's going on. And uh, to picture in my head the whole race, how it's uh, pending out. Because sometimes I will be spending four or five laps trying to work, work out if we have an issue on the car, trying to work out how we can go around it, or trying to talk strategy or tires. On that the laps, I'm not so focused into the feedback for Pierre in terms of how we are looking for uh, cornering speeds on gear usage. And on in that, in that, <laughs> in, uh, oh, no, if I don't hear, yeah, are you I, awake? If I don't hear anything for a while, I'm like, guys, info. Oh, great. GPS. Pedro is cranky again. G GPS, <laughs> GPS. Uh, it's all, it's all at the end. It's all to go faster. And at the same time, I know like the pit wall is, you know, the communication they have is from tons of, Tons, tons of informations coming in, and um, at the end, it's uh, it's not that that simple to always feed me. So, but let's say it's probably uh, the the only only thing that has uh, where I've always been quite keen and, and quite demanding on on that side. But but you know, I think we have a good rhythm as a team together with other engineers, and um, the important thing is that we are honest with each other and we talk to each other like constantly if there is something we're not happy with. You know, if, if there's an issue with a car which we can't see, Pierre is gonna explain to us and make sure we understand. If there is something that maybe Pierre did and we think we could do better or differently, we are gonna t tell him straight away. You know, we don't, we don't keep secrets. We don't um, leave something for the next race or leave something for the next six months and uh, try not to talk about it. We just talk about things and um, that's why we don't have problems. Okay, mm. moving on. Pedro, you're, you're up to date with this. You've done it a few times, but it's time for... Scuderia Alpha Tauri proudly present the one and only world-famous, really excellent, fun, quiz time, spectacular event. That's right, we've got another quiz. Let's see. I'm usually not that great in this. <laughs> <laughs> you're zero for two, I think. <laughs> I've prepared some very easy ones. Are you? Are yeah. you prepared the quiz. No, what, no. Is, what is I, that quiz? I, I had a few ideas on what to ask you. Yeah, but I thought this is we've a got game a, where we got, Yeah, yeah, we've got a double. This is a special time. We've got a double. Okay. So, surprise, Pierre Hamlin has got a, a quiz for you as well. All right. So, what do you want to start with? Do you want to start with my quiz that's about Torosso and Avatari? Or oh, do you want to start with Guys, remember my, my memory for these things. Ah, uh, here I, we go. Ask me about the car setup. <laughs> All right, we're going to start with mine. Let's okay, go. First let's up. Go with yours. Who were our first two drivers for Toro Rosso? Um. You're looking at me, Pierre, like, yeah, you can't. <laughs> it was 2006. Oh, yeah, it was six. I remember it was school tired in the Red Bull. That's not Toro Rosso. That's not Toro Rosso, that's a fair point. Um, <laughs> 2006, Seb arrived in seven. Maybe it's Latoya. So that that was. So Pierre, you're out of this. You can't you can't think, right? I can't think. Okay, you're close. You're getting closer. I've was got Seb some names in my mind, but I, I'm I'm was, really was worried Seb, it's completely was wrong. Seb racing? No, I don't think no. so. Two thousand six, no. What, um, one of them sounds very fast. Uh, That's a good hint. One of them sounds very fast. Scott Speed. Bingo. And and and. I want you to get this. Yeah, because we said his name yesterday at dinner. Scott Speed and... 
Oh my god, I can't, I can't get it. I can't get it. <laughs> With Antonio Luzzi. Luzzi. Oh Close. My god. Okay. Next Should up, I'm not get, I'll give you like half a point for that. Next up, what type of engine were we running in our first year? Ferrari? Nope. Ghost Horse? And? And? What was it? Uh, V2006 was a V10. Well, well done. Yeah. The only V10 of the field. Only V10 of the field. 2006 right. moved to V. That was a trick question, but I think yeah. you can realize it was a trick question. <laughs> 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 okay, moving on. This one's for you, Pierre. Come on. In what year were we awarded the best looking livery on the grid by the fans? Oh my god. This one for Pierre or Pedro? Pierre, come on. Is, uh, You're asking an engineer about the car liveries. I'll go with 2000... 2012. You know, take a wild guess. It's later than that. I'm saying 18. Sorry, it was 2020, the 8001. Ah, uh, yeah? Yeah. Out of the entire field, we were the, voted the best by fans Yo, on the right, F1 I website. I remember 8001, we said that's the... Yeah. Okay, so it's not going that well at the moment, and I've got a harder question coming up. Okay, I thought that, cool. I thought you guys were going to get that. Who scored our first point? Uh, well, I will guess either Luzi or Scott Speed. Or Sebastian Vettel. Oh, Vettel. <laughs> But I'll give you a hint. It's one of those three and pick one. Um, Let's go with Vettel. Go with Vettel, I'll go with... Le ah, I see your face. I'm just taking your expression. <laughs> I'm a great poker <laughs> player. Expression, so. Okay, I'll go with Luzi just to be different. I'll give you the bonus point if you can tell me where. China. Or when. No. China? No, it was 2006 US Grand Prix and he finished P8, the last of the point scoring. Because that was... Ah, yeah, it was, yeah it was only eight. Yeah. yeah. So it's harder to get points. So we've got almost zero. Like I mean, no, you, no, I got. I, I led sorry. you to that. I got. I got. <laughs> it's got two and a half, yeah. I got V10 on the half point uh, for you. That's true. You did get the V10. Yeah, yeah I enjoyed that. Oh, Scott Speed, sorry. Scott Speed. All right. This you both should get this. So Pierre, you currently hold the record for most races with us at 92. But who has the second most races with us? Um, it's either ah. I have an idea. Say it, Pierre, come on. Ricciardo? No. no. No, no. It's either Jeff, either Kvyat, or or Carlos. I'd... It's one of these three. And out of these three... So the Danny is more than Carlos? Like Carlos did a couple of years because he started in... He started with Max 2015. He did full 16. Half of 17. So he did two and a half years. Daniel did... Danny was with... Did a yeah, so I'll go with Carlos. <laughs> Danny. Oh my god. Yeah, Danny Kvyat has uh, 89. Oh, I, I, wasn't, 89. I wasn't far. Yeah, you're far. That's why I'm like, this one. I reckon you can get this. You race engineered him. I'm like, all right, we'll do one more. Yeah. And this one again, I think, I think I, I believe in you. When we won our first race in 2008 with Sebastian Vettel, who joined him on the podium? <laughs> Come on, guys. I will say it will make sense that Prince. There's pictures in our office. Pierre, come on. <laughs> Please. I will say it will make sense, but somehow Prince is. So France didn't, um, France didn't um, come in Monza. So did he come? No, it was gone. Graham was on the podium with you, our team manager. No, no, I know, but we are talking about Seb's podium. Yeah. Who yeah, but I'm trying yeah. to think, if, if Franz did not go in Monza, does that mean he went before? <laughs> well, uh, that will make sense, but I just feel like that's the wrong answer. I'm going to say it's the wrong answer. This was Gerhard. Gerhard. Berger. Hey. Yeah. Pierre. He's in our office on the walls everywhere. I joined the team in 2014. Yeah, so you've been in there a lot of time. Okay, fair enough that you're like you're in you you, you work out of the UK office. No, a lot, sorry. Mostly, so no, I'll give you a bit of that. No, but you're right. <laughs> I, should know, I should know better. All right, you know what? Let's put it on Pierre now because you've got your own quiz. I've got my own okay, quiz. So we agree. I've won that one. Yeah. Okay. You've, you finally got it. Finally got a W. Yeah. Ah, but, but this one, like, I'll be the judge if you win this or not because there's no. I actually have some nuts. Yeah, he probably knows. Yeah, but the goal is not just to... But they're very easy, honestly. Okay, okay. okay. And this, this is going to be an educational quiz because I want our listeners to understand what kind of like radio prompts 
as being is being said over the radio. So if you okay. know if you hear fail eighty four, you go okay. Yeah, but what's that mean? Okay, first question. Okay, because let's start, let's start off with that. What's fail eighty four? Well, it's a switch I gotta do at the end of the the race. <sighs> but do you know why? <laughs> it's for battery. Uh, it's for engine uh, engine related. And if I'm correct, I think it's related to yeah, it's engine related, but probably for the the battery. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So it's to um, because we can't travel the battery full. Exactly. Yeah, so to keep it. So uh, it's to keep it uh, low, empty. Yeah. Um, how many paddles do you have at the back of your steering wheel? It's a trick question for you because you don't use all of them. Yeah. So I would say. We're just talking about paddles. Paddles. Buttons. No, buttons will be too difficult. Okay. And just functions or just no, physical? No. How many physical paddles Six. do we have? Okay. Um, I've got a very easy one, but it's a trick question. <laughs> What's DRS stand for? Drag reduction, drag reduction system. That was an easy one. I, even I knew that one. Come on. <laughs> um, how many times you're allowed to go off the white line during the race <laughs> before you get a penalty? Um, so is, does this stand as Pierre Gasly or <laughs> other drivers or is the rules? What the, what's the rules? Which, if you drive which car? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> okay. So what are the rules saying about leaving the track? You gotta keep a tire on the white line. But as how long many? As the camera can tell you're actually <laughs> on the white. Line. Okay. <laughs> and how many tracks are you allowed? Um, how many strikes? Well, until you get caught and you get, they tell you no more strikes allowed. That's okay, not an but answer. We need a number, I think. Do you have a number? Depends. If, is Lewis behind you or in front of you? <laughs> <laughs> Cut that. <laughs> um, so I think, well, you always tell me one, one, if I have like one more. I think it's like three. Yep. And then the false one, you nice get job. a penalty. Nice job. How many you got left? Just one. Just one. It's a hard one. Surely it's a hard one. It's a bit more difficult. Okay, we can skip that. I, I, I was like, it's uh, doing well. I was a perfect. I'm on a perfect now. When in the race, in the whole race weekend, there is one moment I'm not allowed to talk to you. When is that? Ah, uh, formation lab. All in. That was a hard one. Except if there is a safety issue or concern on the car. On except stewards messages? Yeah. Like uh, you have a penalty. <laughs> well, if you get a penalty on the formation lab, that, I mean, I, we, we have had enough penalties. Let's, yeah. let's, let's touch wood here and make sure we don't get another one till the end of the year. No, but it's, it's, it's an easy one to answer, but it's actually uh, hard to remember because yeah. when, when you're in the car, on Say, you know, he's driving his formation up and he's got something coming to his mind or something he doesn't like on the car. Yeah. He's going to tell us. And you can't respond. But we can't respond. No. I can't even say, we can say it or you can do that. And I will Just say, say sorry, what's... Pierre, you're, you're breaking up. <laughs> <laughs> and I will say, I'm going through a tunnel, connection is poor. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I will say also in this situation, what's, what's difficult, let's say Budapest 2020, where track is drying, and in the formation lap, you are allowed as a driver to come in the pit lane. So in this situation, we know before the race starts, they say, look, we're going to be ready if you call, if you call for, for a pit stop, but we just can't answer you. Yeah. So as a driver, you're committing, you. yeah. you're committing, for example, if you really feel, okay, I got to change my tires, you're committing to the pit lane without, I mean, you're telling the team on the radio, I'm going to box but you always wait for confirmation usually on, on, yeah, on the normal race. But this time race. you can't get it. This time you get no confirmation and once you're boxing, you're you like... Hope they're there. Fully <laughs> in. You're like, yeah, hopefully they heard me. Hopefully they're ready. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's the tricky tricky part of uh, formation up in, this, in these conditions. And just to finish off the quiz, Pierre, off the top of your head, can you give us one or two extra um, driver commands that uh, are quite regular on the radio so our listeners can understand what they kind of mean? I will say like fail... We've done a fail. Fail one, fail. Oh no, we haven't had a fail, have we? What's fail one, fail? F fail one, fail. Admin. Me. Yeah. <laughs> it's a. I'm, I'm gonna guess it's a reset. It's a reset of one of the uh, electronic switches. Close. 
I remember I've, I've, we, I have we, known we, this we, in the past. I would say be, I can't, I can't give it I can't give a point for this one. I'm not the one on trial here. I'm not the one getting quiz. Yeah, we're changing the rules yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> That's what happened when when yeah. we are with two peers. Yeah. <laughs> you sneaky Things Frenches. Go, go off plan. <laughs> no, um, but for the people, li- so that one is for um, having the quick shift. Quick up shift, yeah. Um, shift. But just to answer a question in terms of the um, switches we use quite often is obviously we have a lot of switch to uh, change a little bit the car balance when the car is running. You know, when the tires are degrading, if we lose some rear grip, lose some front grip, uh, we want to try to rebalance the car, so um, we, we stay close to something we like. So we use, uh, you know, every every car has got differential settings, engine braking settings, brake balance, and I would say these are the three common uh, switches we we will call during the race. And yeah. then everything else is uh, background performance items. Yeah, and this differential are also split it between entry phase of the corner. So I have one settings for the entry phase another switch for the mid corner phase, another switch for the exit phase when I go on traction, then I have a fourth switch for the high speed that we said, for example, corners above 200 or 250, this differential and this switch is gonna only affect these specific places. So it's, uh, as a driver, you also have scope to change or like fine tune the, the balance that you get in the car. and. So Pierre, if you wanted to help Pedro um, on his corner entry, um, on the on his on his differential setup on a corner entry, what would you call to him if he's having too much understeer into a corner, for example? So in that case, what we do is um, we we want the car to rotate a bit more easy, so uh, you uh, reduce differential pressure, which means um, you have less restriction from the rear axle, and the car just turns a bit better, a bit earlier. If you have too much understeer. So if I'm, for example, in entry, that switch will be, let's say, average is entry six. Pierre will just call me, okay, entry five, step one step down on the entry. And what we tend to do is to is to give Pierre the flexibility. So we suggest a change, but maybe when we suggest that change, he will say, look, actually the problem is not really in that phase, it's more a bit later, so I should make a different switch. So it's a bit of a two-way discussion of... Um, trying to promote a change because we can see there is an issue and try to find out what's the actual best change to do. Yeah, right. Are there any other engineering commands that you'd want to get out on here to help our fans understand the engineering side of this? Engineering commands? Really stuff that you tell me on the radio. Um, I mean, I think this year, yeah, I remember one race. It happened one this year you asked me a crazy one it was like a crazy a fail. fail f72 and i remember if i'm correct it was probably in zandvoort and in that straight as upshifting probably what yeah a couple of gears in the main straight i had to press 30 times like one time the fail then the plus 10 uh, button 14 times, or like even more, like 17 times to reach the <coughs> F uh, function. Uh, and then uh, another seven times for the 70, and then the two, I was like, oh my God. Like, th- this was a crazy one. I have no idea what it changed, but- uh, just He just trusted Pierre that he knew what he was talking yeah, about. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, that's, that's what happened. I, would you, how many switches or settings can we change with the steering? I, I don't would have, have the precise number, but I remember when Luca told me it so was ridiculous. For the for the fail itself is a, is a very large number. Yeah. But um, because we try to help you and we like you, it's organized in a way where uh, we try to put the one we need. Yeah, of course. A bit easier one, to access. Two, yeah. <laughs> but it's a couple of hundreds of functions that we change, and obviously some of the things are the important one as a driver, you gotta know it. And people don't realize how many times you actually have to press certain buttons to get to a certain fail, like you just mentioned. Like exactly. they probably just think, okay, fail 81 fail or something. It's like, okay, they might press two buttons, but you're pressing and switching. No, but yeah, you're, you're, you're going more than 200 kph and you yeah. have to think about pressing that button And you might be fighting someone as well. Yeah, exactly. Oh, there's someone behind someone, me, shit. Uh, someone behind, someone in front, the air is on. I think it's, actually it's very, Incredible. very um, impressive or quick the driver is able to change yeah, the switches. You know, I take it personally. Sometimes you're like giving me like a hard one. I'm like, <laughs> oh, bad, bad start, bad start. 
I'm like, okay, he's challenging me, okay. And then I'm like, next corner, even I'm cornering, like it's so, it's so super hard. I'm like, I'm just gonna show him I can do it fast, and <laughs> and I'm trying, trying to do it as fast. But um, yeah, it's uh, it, it's it's not easy, and that's one of the thing. F1 is, it's not only about driving. It's about understanding what goes on in the car, being able to cope with your engineer talking to you pretty much every lap being able to react quickly when they they request like feedbacks and and changes like that so it's just uh you got to have clarity in your mind to be to be able to um, yeah deal with all uh, all the informations but yeah to answer our previous question in terms of engineering feedback we gave it depends a lot about the session so in qualifying we're going to talk a lot about hot laps tire treatment what we want Pierre to do in the hot laps on where to brake hard on where to push where to save the tires on uh, what to do during uh, his time lap with all his switches. On in the race, it's a bit different. You, um, you want to try to help reduce um, wheel spin on corner exit, try to save those rear tires. You want to try to help him um, adjust his balance. So it's, it's very, very uh, variable depending on where we are in the race weekend. And a lot about traffic, a lot of work with traffic. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much for the engineering lesson. Pierre and Pedro, because you still know more about me. I think I'm going to keep to my day job. Like, <laughs> you've made it very clear. If I can't answer one switch, I'm going to stick stick behind the board here. Well, I probably have no no idea of how to make that work. So you know, we all got a, our own job. And uh, even in terms of uh, engineering, even I like it. I think it's still in safer hands with uh, with Pierre, and I have full trust on him, which is uh, which is the most important. So. No, I think it, we have uh, we have had great years. Still, three more uh, three more races together, and you know what? I remember just as we were talking earlier, we had like this whole conversation for the past uh, couple of minutes, and uh, I was thinking, oh my god, yesterday I I had a really nice dream and I could not remember. And as we talked about the podium, I dreamed last night that we were having a podium. I can't remember where, how, but I was like, this is. I have something in mind, like it was so really to come. Cool yeah. and I, I woke up like in a great mood. Uh, it wasn't so clear what I was thinking about, but I just <laughs> remember like some podium or something. And now as we were listening to all of that, I just remember that. Um, so it's God, a good knows, omen. God, God knows what's going to happen either here, Brazil, or we go back to Brazil. We know it yeah. quite well. Just made it slightly harder for us with the spring race this year. <laughs> we know we don't like the spring race. <laughs> we don't need but, to talk about those. <laughs> but um, no, yeah, I think it's been clearly the most successful uh, relationship uh, and uh, yeah I'm kind of sad to give Pierre away to another driver yeah. <laughs> it's okay I'll, I'll keep sending you audio clips so you keep, uh, <laughs> keep tabs on him I'm good at that well thank you so much for your time today guys really appreciate it that was a very good long episode and we really appreciate your time Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. If you want more Alvatari goodness right now, you can subscribe to Tari Talk on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts and listen back to previous episodes till your heart's content. Plus, you'll get all the episodes as they drop. So what's not to like? Until next time, have a good one. <laughs>